Hi, I'm Joy Lawrence. Welcome to my Langston Hughes Biography and Poetry Analysis. The sources I used for this presentation, Encyclopedia Britannica, the Library of Congress Presents America's Story, National Gallery of Art, an article in the New York Times called The Darker Brother, written by Gwendolyn Brooks, the essential writings of Frederick Ingalls, Poetry Foundation, Biography.com, and the collected works of Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was born in 1902, and he died in 1967. Because I'm going to have you do poetry analysis of your own, I want to also go over one of Langston Hughes's poems with you in this presentation. This is the poem that we're going to talk about later in the presentation, after I've gone over the biography of Langston Hughes. It's called Dinner Guest Me. It was written in 1965. A couple of things before I start. These two sections that we would call paragraphs in a story or an essay are called stanzas in poetry. Also, when you read a poem, you don't read the line, you read the punctuation. So you don't have a hard stop at the end of each line. You have a hard stop with a period. You have a pause with a comma. You have a stop or a pause with a dash. I know I am the Negro problem being wined and dined, answering the usual questions that come to white mind, which seeks demurely to probe in polite way the why and wherewithal of darkness USA, wondering how things got this way in current democratic night, murmuring gently over Frise du Bois, I'm so ashamed of being white. The lobster's delicious, the wine divine, and center of attention at the damask table, mine. To be a problem on Park Avenue at eight is not so bad. Solutions to the problem, of course, wait. I'm going to come back to this poem, like I said, at the end of my presentation. For now, I just want it to marinate in your brains while I talk a little bit about Langston Hughes. He was born in Joplin, Missouri in 1902. This is a picture of Langston Hughes here, and in the background is his father. His father studied law and after he passed the bar exam, he wanted to move to Mexico because he was tired of the race relations in the United States and how detrimental they were to the African-American community. He moved to Mexico hoping that he would fare better. Langston Hughes's mother did not want to move to Mexico, so they got a divorce. Langston Hughes was raised by his grandmother until he was 13, and then he moved in with his mother and her new husband. After he graduated from high school, he spent a year in Mexico. And one of the reasons that he did that, one of the main reasons, was because he wanted to connect more with his father. While he was in Mexico, he attempted suicide. And there's large speculation that Langston Hughes was gay and that his fighting with his father, which he did a lot of in Mexico during that year that he was visiting him, a lot of that fighting was due to Langston Hughes being gay. We don't have a lot of evidence that he was gay, but like I said, there's general speculation that he was gay and that he included clues in a lot of his works. The biggest clue that we have is a play that he wrote about a young man whose father hates him because he's gay. After his year in Mexico, he spent a year at Columbia University, but he really wanted to travel. He couldn't afford to, so he got a job as a crewman aboard a ship, and that was how he was able to travel to Africa and Europe. After his travels, he got a job as a busboy at a, a cafe in a hotel. And while he was there one day working, he saw Vichelle Lindsay come in, who was a noted literary critic. Langston Hughes knew Vichelle Lindsay, who he was, and that Vichelle Lindsay could make his career. He took a couple of his poems and put them down on the table next to Vichelle Lindsay's plate. Next day, newspapers reported that Vichelle Lindsay had discovered a busboy poet. It was this discovery that helped get him into Lincoln University, which is where he graduated. Langston Hughes had a controversial writing style. He used African-American vernacular in his writing. Now, there's a longer story, and I feel like I never do this justice when talking about what African-American vernacular is. The short version is that it's African-American slang. 
Now, what was controversial about this was that the audiences that could afford to buy poetry were rich white audiences. And Langston Hughes was told that he was going to alienate that audience if he used African-American vernacular. And he said he didn't care. That wasn't why he created art. Another thing he liked to do was to integrate the cadences of jazz and blues in his poetry. He would go and listen to jazz bands perform while he wrote his poetry so that he could incorporate that rhythm and that music. He said that he wanted to incorporate that pulse beat of the people who keep on going. In 1932, he wrote for Soviet newspapers. At the time, he was living in Russia. He had gone to Russia to work on a movie, but when he got there, that project fell through. And he thought, hey, I'm here. Might as well look around, live here, experience it. And he needed a job, he needed money, and he did what he knew, which was to write. Now in our country in the 1950s, we went a little bit crazy with communism because of the Cold War that we had with Russia. Langston Hughes, because he had lived in Russia and had written for Soviet newspapers, he was accused of being a communist. During this time period, you could be put in jail for being a communist. We had all kinds of of court hearings like this one here where Langston Hughes is testifying before the Un-American House Committee. He was expected to testify whether or not he was a communist and if he was a communist he was supposed to name all of the other communists that he knew so that our government could go after them and put them in jail also because of their ideology. Not because of anything that they had done but because of their belief system. He was not a communist, but he did believe in equality and the need for America to have more equality, more racial equality. That brings me to what you have to do for your literary analysis for Langston Hughes. You need to do the Marxist criticism, and I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about Marxism in relation to Langston Hughes. And that's why I have these essential writings of Frederick Engels here as my source. So Marxism considers the corruption of society by capitalism, by that need to have businesses continuing to earn more and more profit. And Marxism promotes a society without elite or servant classes. So you can see how this would be very popular with several uh, members of our community as time goes on, especially at this time period, we're in the middle of the civil rights movement and we're fighting for equality. So Langston Hughes was one who wanted to incorporate that into his art and his poetry. So that's what I want you to think about when you are analyzing one of his poems. What do you have going on in the poem that represents the corruption of society and a working class that is suppressed. So when you're analyzing literature you under Marxist criticism, you're looking at literature as products of those ideologies that support the elite and suppress the working class. Back to Langston Hughes. For Langston Hughes, art equaled politics. He saw no need or reason to separate the two. And for him, the message that he wanted to get out was the need in our country for racial and economic justice. A lot of times Langston Hughes was invited to be a speaker at a college, for example, or to come read some of his poetry. He was very well known, and sometimes he was invited before the people who invited him really had taken the time to get to know his poetry, and then he would be uninvited. In one particular case, he was actually in the hotel and the next morning he was going to go to the college to read some of his poetry when representatives of that college came to him that night at the hotel and told him, yeah, we read your poetry, please don't come tomorrow, but go ahead and stay in the hotel. This is a quote of his talking about those experiences. He says, I'm sure none of these things would ever have happened to me had I limited the subject matter of my poems to roses and moonlight. But unfortunately, I was born poor and colored, and almost all the prettiest roses I have seen have been in rich white people's yards, not in mine. That is why I cannot write exclusively about roses and moonlight, for sometimes in the moonlight my brothers see a fiery cross on a circle of clansmen's hoods. Sometimes in the moonlight a dark body sways from a lynching tree, but for his funeral there are no roses. 
I like this quote because it illustrates what Langston Hughes wanted to get across to his audience and what message he wanted to share. Langston Hughes died of complications of prostate cancer in 1967. One of the things that I did want to touch on a little bit was the Harlem Renaissance. I know I'm not having you do new historicism for this, but I did want to give you a little bit of this information because Langston Hughes was so instrumental in the Harlem Renaissance. He was considered one of the prominent writers from that movement. So the Harlem Renaissance was a period of time in our country's history when so many artists came up out of Harlem that they dubbed it the Harlem Renaissance. The precursor to the Harlem Renaissance was what was called the Great, Mar Ma the Great Migration. And this was um, job opportunities in the North created by World War I encouraged a lot of African Americans who did not have jobs or had low paying jobs to migrate to New York and a lot of them settled in Harlem. So the Harlem Renaissance is the period of time about the end of World War I through the mid 1930s. These are some paintings that came up out of the Harlem Renaissance. So it wasn't just writers, it was painters, musicians. And one of the things that the African American community of artists was encouraged to do was to put their politics and their messages into their art. And so they were able to highlight things like inequality, living on the margins of society. Back to dinner guest me. So we have here, dinner guest me, the persona in the poem is the guest of honor at a dinner party. And it starts out, I know I am the Negro problem being wined and dined, answering the usual questions that come to white mind, which seeks demurely to probe in polite way the why and wherewithal of darkness USA, wondering how things got this way in current democratic night. So he's at this party and people are talking about the inequality in America and how things got this way when we're supposed to be living in a democracy where everyone is equal. So how is it that black America is not equal? And of course, this is 1965. The civil rights movement is in full swing at this point. Also, we are to assume that he is very uncomfortable in this setting. He says here, that the people are murmuring gently over Frise Dubois, I'm so ashamed of being white. Frise Dubois, uh, that is French for fancy, expensive strawberries. So this is the upper class that we are peeking in at right here. And he is the guest of honor at this party and he's uncomfortable. So the other guests at the party are saying how ashamed they are of being white. So why is this offensive? Why is this making him uncomfortable? Because they would not be having this conversation were he not there. This entire conversation is for his benefit. This proclamation of shame is for his benefit. Are they really ashamed? Hmm. Now for the next stanza, the lobster's delicious, the wine divine, and center of attention at the damask table, mine, a damask table, a fancy, table setting. So here he is, he's eating fancy strawberries, eating lobster, drinking wine, and he is the center of attention. But then he says to be a problem on Park Avenue at eight is not so bad because again, he's eating expensive food. He is the guest of honor and Park Avenue. You've played Monopoly. You know what Park Avenue is about. It's one of the most expensive pieces on the board. So here he is at a fancy dinner party, eating expensive food. There are worse situations to be in. However, solutions to the problem, of course, wait. So it's not so bad, but it's still a problem. And how is the solution going to come? We have to wait for it. We need time. Are things better? Hmm, yes. Are they all the way better? No, absolutely not. So this poem is just as relevant today and can be used to analyze our society and culture today, just like it could be used to analyze the culture and society of 1965. I hope I've given you something to help you with your literary analysis. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.